Hello and welcome to this new video, today we are talking about H-Trees. What are they, what do they do, and why are they so overpowered? Coming up! So yes, today we are talking about H-Trees. This video is a follow-up for the EXT3 video, so if you haven't watched it, you really should, and if you haven't watched the EXT2 before that, you really should as well. Now, you've probably never heard of H-Trees before, and that's normal, it's because it's not something that gets talked a lot about. It's actually the first video on YouTube that will go in detail about H-Trees while still being fun to watch, so I hope you enjoy. But why are H-Trees even useful? Why did they save EXT3 and what did they do? Now, to answer all of those questions, we need to have a little bit of background. Now, EXT2 and EXT3 had a huge problem. That problem was that if you would put enough file inside of a directory, your directory would slow down. Meaning that if you were to put, let's say, 10,000 file inside of one directory, and you would need to find one file inside of that directory, it would be really, really slow. Now, why would that be? That's because of the structure of how the file system would store their file. Now, how would ext2 and ext3 actually store their file. They would store it inside of, of what would be essentially a linked list. So you would have one block full of directory entries and if you needed more place it would just be yet another block with directory entries inside of them. Now like I said that design is not an issue if you've got a small amount of file but when you get to the 10,000 that's not gonna work. Now, let's just take two minutes to actually understand how other file system would solve this problem. So here we see how ext2 and ext3 would do it. It would be a simple linked list. Now, this linked list happened to be ordered, but in reality, it wouldn't be. It would just be a bunch of entries thrown around. So in that example, if we were to want the file zero, it would be really fast. But if we would want the file six, it would be really long because we would need to ask for every node in our list to end up getting the file that we need. Now, most file system will actually use something called a binary tree. Now, the reason why you use a binary tree is because it's way faster. Let's just make an example. Let's say that we need six just like we wanted before. We have the node three at the top, and that's where we start. So looking at the node three, the question that we ask is, are we at the right node? Well, six isn't three, so now we ask, is it bigger or smaller? If it's bigger, we go to the right. If it's smaller, we go to the left. Now, of course, six is bigger than three. So we go to the right, and then we ask exactly the same question. Is five six? No. Is it bigger or smaller? It's bigger, so we go to the right. And now we got our actual node that we want. Is 6-6? Six, six? Yes, it is. So we have our data. So you can see how you're improving a lot the speed of your system because you don't have to go seek data five or six times to get to your node. You're actually limited to three here. So that makes things way faster. Now, let's just note a couple of things to be able to add it later. To be able to transform a linked list into a binary tree, we need three things. We need your list to be ordered, we need to know the quantity of node inside of our list, and we need to have each node of our list have the same size. So remember that those three things are really important if we want to transform a linked list into a binary tree. Because if you see, what we have here is exactly the same thing. Our binary tree is our linked list. So at that point, if the nodes are the same are the same size and we know how much nodes we have, we obviously could do a binary tree with that linked list. Now, just so you have all of the information in the world to be a big brain person that you are, let's just look at how real file system will normally use the binary tree because they won't use the standard binary tree. They will use a B plus or a B star three. In other words, they will use a slight modification of the binary tree and it will look a little bit more like this. 
Now the idea here is that you make bigger nodes for each node of your binary tree. That way you're able to take advantage of the fact that your R drive will only be able to output a big chunk of data at a time. So let's say that your hard drive is able to give you a node of 124 smaller node inside of it at a time. Well, you just make your big nodes 124 small nodes, you ship them together, and now you're able to run through your binary tree faster because computation is always cheaper, is always faster than actually going back to your hard drive. So putting more node into one big node is a fast way to do things inside of file system logic. But let's go back to htrace for this video. Now, how does an htree actually look and why did we need all of this background? Now with Linux 2.5.42, we have this magical htree. Now I will go through and explain everything here, but I'm gonna need to have your full cooperation for this because that might get a little complicated. So here we have three types of block. We have the directory root, we have the directory index block, and we have the directory entry blocks. Now, the only block that technically fully exists under a standard ext2 or ext3 model is the directory entry block. So our directory en entry block at the end are really just standard entry block. All of the others are slightly modified. So what they do is that they will put an entry that is a fake directory entry, and inside of that entry it will say, hey, I was a deleted entry, and you can just skip the data that is under me. So the reason why you have that entry is because it needs to be forward and backward compatible with ext2 or version of ext3, which wouldn't be able to read the htrees. Now that was one of the rule for any features in, inside of ext3, and it of course applies with htrees. So to be able to keep that compatibility, they would mask the htree data inside of that deleted directory entry. Now let's just make some sense of what we're seeing. Here, all of our directory entries are ordered. So they are from small to big. Now, how do we order them? We order them by hashing them. So hashing is the process of taking a name or a value or some data and putting it through a function. And at the end, you should get back a number. So it's just to be able to fit a number that we can manipulate after. So each directory entry will be hashed, and after that it will be placed inside of a directory block, making sure that it's ordered. Now you might say, oh, we have a big list that is ordered, we probably can do a binary tree with this, right? Well, this is where the size of the node actually matter. Remember our tree rules? We have an ordered list, we need to know how many nodes we have, and we need to make sure that each node have the same size. So here, our directory entries don't have the same size, because remember, the name of the directory entry can be bigger or smaller. So that kind of destroy our fun, right? We cannot have a binary tree at that level. So the solution to this is to try to put each directory block as a bucket. So just think of each directory block as their own bucket. What we are going to do is we are going to label each bucket. How are we going to label them? We are going to label them by the smallest hash that they contain. So remember, each directory entries are ordered. We will label each of them by their smallest hash, and then we will put their label inside of a directory index block. Now here, the directory index block will contain an array of hashes and block number to be able to find the directory entry block. Now here, what you might see is that now we have everything needed in order to do a binary search. We have ordered nodes, we know the quantity of our nodes because we have a count node at the start, and each nodes are the same size because the hash and the block size won't change. So here we can actually do binary search throughout an index block. And after that, if we follow the schematics, what we can see is that we have the same process happen again. So we will take the smallest hash and we would put it inside of an entry 
inside of the directory root block. So that way we can do the same thing again and store even more names while still being optimal. Now I understand that this may be a little weird at the start and that may not be as obvious how it works. So we're actually going to do a full example. We're going to run through as if we're trying to find some data. So let's say that we want to find a file. This file is called banana and banana ends up hashing to 222. So the first thing that we do is we of course go to our directory root block. And inside of that directory root block, we have the two first directory entry, which are necessary for any directory to work, which is self, which is the directory itself, and the parent directory, which of course is the directory above it. And after that, we have the actual H3 code. Now, within our directory root block, what we see is that we have three index block. The first one being 11, the second one being 567, and the third one being 800. Now, I'm just going to help you a little bit visualize how the computer would go about finding something inside of that. So here, because we have the count, because we know that we have three nodes inside of that list, we can make a three out of it. Now, let's just look at the tree. And what we see here is that we have our first node, which is the middle node, is 567. Now the question that we need to ask ourselves is, first, are we at the right node? And the answer is no, of course, 222 is not 567. So at that point, we ask ourselves, is 222 smaller than 567? The reason why we're asking this is because if it's smaller, it cannot be 567 and it cannot be any node under that because each of our nodes here represent the smallest value possible inside of the nodes. So 567 being bigger than 222, we need to go look upward at the 11th node. Now, because 11 is our only choice, we would follow that block. And here, by following that block, we see that we now have an index block with five entries inside of it. Now, remember, we always start from the middle. So let's just build that tree to be able to see how it would work. So here we have our three. We'll, we start by 333. Are we bigger or smaller than 333? We're, of course, smaller. We go up, and what we see here is that we are at 100. Now, 222 being bigger than 100, we now know that we're at the right node because there is no node between the 100 node and the 333 node. We know that the most likely node to have our data is the 100 node. So here we would follow the 100 node. Following that node, we have a directory entry block. And here we just have to do the good old read the whole block to find our banana file. So I hope this makes things a little bit clearer on how you're supposed to read and find things a little bit faster, because here we have things that make things fast. We don't have to search each directory block because just following the structure, just following the H tree kind of cuts down on everything and makes it a kind of weird binary search. I hope this was clear and that made things a little bit clearer. Now we're going to just delve a little bit further just for people that love that, uh, that kind of things. Now the way that H trees work when you add elements is fairly simple. What you're going to do is you're going to add element at their place within the whole H tree structure, meaning that we need to keep the order. So if we're adding a new directory entry, so a new file inside of our directory, we would find where it goes and just place the directory entry at the right place within a block. Now, if the block becomes too big, let's say that we don't have enough space within one directory block to put all of our directory entry, well, at that point, we would divide that block and create a new entry inside of that directory index block that is above it to be able to store more entries. Now, the same logic goes for your directory index block themselves. When they become full, you would split them and then put the new entry inside of the directory root block. Now, believe it or not, that fairly simple change meant that you had up to 145 time faster search inside of the file system. So this is a big upgrade. You could have some crazy situation where you would get 
way better performance, of course, because you're limiting the amount of blocks that you have to go get from your file system. And that also would still work within the rules that were set for ext3. Remember, we have forward and backward compatibility and we add simplicity. Now, of course, the implementation of htrees may seem a little bit complex to our untrained eye, but actually implementing htrees is fairly simple and uses way less lines of code than a standard b3. When we think about a standard b3, uh, it would use about 10,000 lines for the simplest one that you would be able to implement, and ext2 itself would be 5,000 lines. So when you think about that, that's why nobody would want to add real binary trees inside of ext2 or ext3, even though it was theorized that we would need to do that if no other solution were found. But of course, h3 exists, a solution was found, and everything was saved. Now again, trying to fill in for all the curious people, if you want to know how htrees add a little bit more secrets up their sleeve, any inode of a directory would have a place to store feature data, and in that feature data, they could tell you if they add an htree or not inside of it. And what was really smart is that if ever you would modify that directory, let's say that you were using ext2, while mounting that partition with htrees in them, and you were to modify a directory with htree inside of them with a not compatible system, it would actually wipe the feature from the inode. So that's how the system could see that you've modified the htree and would know not to trust it. And all of those features were kind of baked in, they already knew that they would probably find something that would save their file system even from the first version. And that's what's crazy with ext2 and ext3, is how much everything was overthinked to the point that everything just works, even to add things that were not even thought of as possible at the time. Now this is all for that video, I know that the end may be a little bit scatterbrained, it's because it's hard to know what you want to see and what you don't want to see in such a specific video. And I know that nobody knows anything about h so if I've heard <laughs> people want more de detail or something, put your question in the comment and I'll be more than happy to answer it. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, of course, leave a like. I'm going to attempt to do a new video each week. So of course, subscribe so that we can continue on our streak. And of course, take care.